Yeah, I think we will get started. It's a minute after the hour. So this is the fourth, if, I have, if I'm keeping my um, track of it, this is the fourth colloquium series. And today I'm really happy that we're going to be um, covering topics that are quite different from the last two, although maybe a little closer to, to, to Chris's talk. Um, and I'm happy to welcome a real expert in this field, Deborah Matthews from Hopkins, to, to give today's talk. As these speakers are tasked with telling you a little bit about where they are where and how they got there, I'll keep the introduction really short. Just, just tell you that um, uh, as of last year, Deborah became a full professor in the Department of Genetics Medicine, Genomic Genetic Medicine at, at Hopkins. But she's also the associate director for research and programs at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, which is affiliated with Hopkins and located in a former um, police station uh, on the medical school campus, uh, including some offices that are in old cells. If you ever get to tour it, it's interesting. Uh, and she also holds a secondary appointment in uh, Department of Pediatrics, where there's a, a lot of genetics in early in life, um, especially at, at Hopkins. Uh, I've known Deborah for a very long time. We meet occasionally to disagree about things over coffee, which is always really fun. Um, and Deborah is a internationally known and, and internationally sought after to serve on commissions in other countries, which as I can, as far as I can tell, involves getting to go to other countries to tell them what she's thinking about. Uh, we'll stop there uh, just to let you know that you have a big wig in the room right now and it's not me, it's Deborah. And she's going to give today's colloquium. And I will turn it over to Deborah. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak with you all today. So I've been given some instructions about um, what to talk about. Give me just a second as I orient all the various windows. All right, so I will be talking today about um, ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics and genomics. But before I get in, into that, um, I was asked to talk about how I got to where I am. So first, I think it's important to note that I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> and I don't think there's any shame in that. You're allowed to reinvent yourselves. Um, but the fact is I've, I've known I wanted to be a scientist since I was quite young. I was that kid with a margarine dish walking through the woods and picking under rocks and streams, picking up salamanders and lizards and snakes, et cetera. And as soon as I gave up on Olympic gymnast, it was scientist. That's what I wanted to do. I just find... The natural world, absolutely fascinating. Um, and in 11th grade, I had the opportunity to take an elective on genetics and that was it. Like <laughs> that was the area of science I, I wanted to go into. I was just hooked. I don't know how, how else to explain it. Um, I, went to uh, college at Penn State, um, which Larry alluded to, uh, and did yeast genetics there in a lab. And because, uh, which I found fasc fascinating, of course, super tractable model system. Um, and then I went overseas, actually, to Copenhagen uh, to work at Carlsberg Brewery. I, I don't know if there are beer drinkers in the audience, but uh, Carlsberg has, since its very earliest days, had a research lab as affiliated with it. And I was in the yeast genetics um, part of that research facility in the basic side of the department. I had colleagues in the applied side who had beers come out while I was there. Um, but... Uh, when I was thinking about going back to college, so I took a year off to go um, do yeast genetics at Carlsberg. When I was thinking about what I wanted to do in my senior year of college coming back, like I loved yeast genetics. Again, like you can do a ton in that system, uh, but it wasn't 
close enough to applicability for me. So I have also, the other sort of strand of my story is that since high school, I've also been very involved in social justice work, service learning, et cetera. Um, and for me, again, yeast, great, interesting, but not close enough to actual applicability and change in the world. So when I went back for my senior year, I moved into a non-human primate lab, which was great. And again, super interesting. And I happened also to be next to um, Mark Stone King, who was doing ancient DNA work, which was also fascinating. Um, and then I was looking, you know, in my senior year, trying to decide what to do for grad school. Again, knew I wanted to do genetics, but non-human primates still not quite close enough to applicability. Um, so I started looking into human genetics. And um, the person whose lab I was in introduced me to a former um, postdoc of his. Uh, and, and again, I was sort of hooked. Uh, I will say that, so this next bullet, Cleveland, not Houston, I applied lots of places for um, lots of different human genetics programs across the country. And because of this other sort of part of me, uh, which was an interest in justice and equity and ethics, although honestly, I didn't at that time know that there was such a thing as bioethics in the world as a field. Uh, and everywhere I interviewed for grad school, I said, you know, when I'm doing my PhD in human genetics, I'd also like to get a master's in like philosophy uh, or, or ethics or something. Um, not again, not knowing exactly what that meant. And, uh, a, a scientist who shall remain nameless at a university that shall remain nameless uh, in Houston, when I, I said this, said, what does ethics have to do with science? In contrast, uh, at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, I sat next to a, a, a faculty member at lunch and was explaining this. And he said, oh, well, we have a bioethics center here. I'll take you over after lunch and introduce you to um, Tom Murray, who was the head of it at the time. And after that, I managed to work with Tom uh, Hunt Willard, who was the chair of the department at the time, and Arvind Chakravarti, who um, ended up being my thesis advisor, to do both things. So during grad school, I got a PhD in human genetics and also got a master's in bioethics. Now, during my um, PhD, actually after I was done with all my coursework, but before I was done with my research, uh, my thesis advisor took a job in Baltimore at Hopkins uh, and I decided to move with him. So I came to Baltimore, uh, not only because Hopkins is great, but also because of its proximity to Washington DC and my interests in ethics and policy and uh, governance. And then I did postdocs again, because I couldn't, I was still trying, hadn't picked a lane yet. I did a science postdoc and I also did an ethics postdoc, um, the Greenwall Fellowship in Bioethics and Health Policy, which was a joint program between Hopkins and Georgetown universities. And then uh, I was sort of in the middle of my um, science postdoc trying to decide what I would do next. And this job came up at Hopkins that was the assistant director for science programs, which would allow me to still work in science, but from this other side, right? From this other perspective. Um, so I took the job. Well, I applied for the job. Happily, I got the job. Um, and I've spent my career um, now at Hopkins in a scientific department, but doing this other side of science. Um, I have found it tremendously rewarding, um, not only because I still get to hang out with my science people, <laughs> um, 
but I also feel like I have a, a closer connection to direct impact. I mean, I have amazing scientific colleagues here at Hopkins who are having tremendous impact on patient care and research. And not everybody gets to have that impact in science. You have to be really smart and really lucky. Um, and I wanted, I felt like given my skills and interests, I would have a better shot at impact doing science from this other perspective, because I know science, it's my native language, molecular biology, genetics, and I can translate and I can not only sort of think about the ethical issues, but really key in on what are the key scientific details that drive the ethical issues and how do we think about that? So uh, it's been a bit of a, uh, circuitous route. Um, I'm not a scientist at the bench anymore and haven't been for a very long time, uh, but I'm still very much involved in science, in projects, in genetics, in stem cell science, neuroscience, synthetic biology. Um, I'm now doing AI, which is not molecular, molecular biology based, um, but very interesting nonetheless. All right. My understanding is we aren't doing questions until the end of the sort of LC 101 section, uh, but I'll, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions about this part of the talk later. So now I'm going to go into the LC 101 section. Again, LC ethical, legal, and so social implications of genetics and genomics. But that would be the se second topic I'll talk about. Um, first, I'm going to talk about eugenics. Then I'll talk about the LC program. And then I'll talk about a several of the sort of core issues in LC that we talk about a lot. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about some examples of how we govern in this space. So I think it's important to start with eugenics because eugenics is the history of human genetics. It's where the field started. Um, and a critically important point about it, so this early 1900s uh, in the US, but not just in the US, also in the UK and elsewhere, uh, eugenics was entirely mainstream. It was not fringe science. It was the key people were at places like the University of Chicago, Yale, and at Johns Hopkins. So one of the folks whose name was on the masthead of the first eugenics journal, his name is on the Hopkins Medical Library to this day. So this was not fringe. This was core scientific community. And it didn't just stay in the scientific community either. It was very much um, part of um, public conversation and ultimately policy, right? So there would be eugenic, so fitter family contests at state fairs where you could get, if you were selected, a big you know button with a ribbon that said, yay, I have a goodly heritage. Um, the folks who won these were predominantly white, large white religious families, which tells you something about sort of what was normative, meaning what was viewed as sort of eugenic ideal, right? Whiteness, wealth, um, elocution, <laughs> uh, and those sorts of traits were prized um, and were considered superior to those folks with those traits were considered su superior to folks who did not have those traits. There, and that includes a strong focus on race as well. One of, there were um, developed, and I'm 
I should say, this is like an entire lecture that I've turned into one slide. So <laughs> this is just a small um, piece of this story. Uh, but there were there was a cohort of folks called eugenics caseworkers who were sent out into the um, cities, towns, countryside to draw family trees and trace these traits through families, the good traits and the not good traits by the eugenicists estimation. Um, and these eugenic caseworkers were the predecessors of today's genetic counselors, All right? And this is one of the reasons that one of the main sort of a core ethos of genetic counselors is non-directiveness, right? We will give you the information and help you understand and process the information, but we're not gonna tell you what to do with it, right? And strong echoes of eugenics persist, um, and particularly um, around race, particularly around behavioral traits. Um, and yeah, I, I think I will leave it there for now. So the next sort of key part of the LC world that I wanna tell you about is the LC program. So the ethical, legal, and social implications program of the Human Genome Project is part of NHGRI at NIH, um, where many of you are sitting right now. Uh, and uh, from the very, from an early point in the Genome Project, in fact, before it was even officially launched, right? Uh, there was a press conference and Jim Watson, the first head of the genome Pro project um, was giving a press conference and a reporter asked a question and said, so if you're, you're gonna sequence the whole genome, you're prob there are probably gonna be some ethical issues associated with that. And Jim Watson took a beat and said, yes, and I'm gonna devote 5% of my budget to studying those issues and created the largest funding program for ethics in the history of the world. Uh, it still exists today. It was originally sort of an intramural program at NIH. It's now an extramural funding um, component of NIH. Full disclosure, I have LC um, grants. I have had LC grants. Um, and it, it was the first program of its kind and had an impact more broadly than just in genomics. So the LC program was sort of critical to the development of the field and to bioethics more generally. And the, the acronym LC has become sort of shorthand for ethics and governance issues raised across a range of technologies. Now I've listed here the original goals of the LC program. Um, I hope that you see that they still actually feel very contemporary, right? It's not that we haven't solved any of the problems, <laughs> right? But the technology keeps changing around us as does society, right? So as the technology changes, and I'll come back to this um, throughout my lecture, as the technology changes, the nature of these issues change as well. All right. So one of the core issues in, in LC is concerns around privacy, right? There are lots of different definitions of privacy. The one I like to use is from Madison Powers, a condition or state in which cognitive access to personal information is restricted. I get to decide what you know about me. So why do we care about genetic privacy in particular? Well, this information can be used for good and bad purposes, right? Uh, it can affect your social and economic well-being if it's used to make decisions about you know, what jobs you have access to or what care you have access to, et cetera. It can impact psychological interests, right? Your self-concept, your capacity for functioning, concerns about social stigma, et cetera. I mean, the example, uh, well, we all shape our relationships based on how much information we share, right? Not in a Machiave Machiavellian way, just the kind of information that I would share on this broadcast, <laughs> right? 
is very in with you all is very different than the kind of information I would share with my child or my closest friend or my partner. Right. And if you all suddenly had information about me that I would normally only share with uh, people closest to me, that would affect our relationship. Right. And the kind of relationship we had. Uh, sorry, I skipped to relational, I'll go back to psychological interests. Right. We um, I, I wanted to add a point there, which is that we have in LC long had this notion of a right not to know. Right. The genome can be a bit of a Pandora's box uh, and not everybody wants to know what's in it because it can change how we think about ourselves. Right. Our self-concept, it can change how we think about what we are capable of. So not everybody wants to know. Relational interests I already talked about, although I'll add one anecdote, which is I have two kids. Um, I have multiple times given uh, talks to their science classes over the years. Uh, and one time I was talking to one of my kids' third grade classes. So these are eight-year-olds in Baltimore City, um, telling them about what genetics is and a bit about what I do. And I said to them, this class of eight-year-olds, if I told you that I could look in your genome and tell that when you grow up, you're gonna get a no good, terrible, very bad disease, would you want me to tell your parents? The entire class yelled no <laughs> at the top of their lungs. It's like, that is fascinating, why not? Well, your parents might not let you do what you wanna do. Your friends might treat you differently. These eight-year-olds like intuitively got it, the power of this information. And then finally, autonomy interests, if the information is used to shape what you can and cannot do. And privacy from whom, right? Not only parents, um, but also the government, employers, insurers, mortgage lenders, et cetera. Now, we most often pair privacy with discrimination, right? Concerns about how the information can be used by others in decision making. Um, also, stigmatization, right? If folks view you in a particular way because of what is in your genome that they now know, uh, and the allocation of restrictions or liberties, again, impacts on autonomy. Now, the challenge is that there's not really any way anymore to guarantee that genetic information will remain private, right? This is a series of papers that demonstrated that the kinds of protections, privacy protections that we used to have, um, that we have historically used to main, keep genetic information private, have started to fall away. So this first paper by Homer et al. demonstrated that if you had a pooled sample and an identified sample, you could figure out whether that identified sample was present in the pooled sample. Pooling samples was one way that we used to increase anonymity. And then a series of papers after that demonstrated, again, that because of advances in the science and uh, um, tools that we had to analyze the data, what the protections were shifting. And if that Homer et al. paper was sort of the first shoe to drop, the G this Jimrick et al. paper was the second. So Melissa Jimrick, who was a grad student at the time um, in Jan of Ehrlich's lab, demonstrated that she could go from de-identified genetic data to names, family trees, et cetera, in the course of an afternoon with publicly available information. Now, the reason that she could do that is because by this point, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, direct-to-consumer genetic testing was available, and there was just a lot uh, more genetic information available out in the world. And I will come back to that point um, multiple times during my talk as well. I also want to point out uh, or discuss briefly, um, not only because I am at Hopkins, but also because this has been an important, I think was a, this was an important event in the history of ELSI, um, 
is the relationship of Henrietta Lacks and her family to this field, right? So the, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sklute came out in 2010 and talked about um, Henrietta Lacks, who was a woman uh, with cervical cancer who came to Hopkins for care in 19, um, in the in 1951. Uh, and a sample of uh, her tissue was turned into the first immortalized cell line. This was a huge advance. This has been critically important for science, but, um, Later, many years later, her name was revealed. She was re-identified. Uh, and because she was re-identified, her family was now connected to the HeLa cell line, which was very, very, very well studied. Now, if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. Um, it's, an, again, an important part of this history and led to... Um, not only a data access committee being established at NIH that has members of the Lax family on it, but also um, had a lot of sort of downstream effects, um, certainly at Hopkins, but elsewhere as well. Now I'm going to go into a number of other issues um, that we think quite a lot about in LC and or have historically thought quite a lot about. So with regard to genetic testing, um, if you were talking about Mendelian conditions, right? So in theory, one gene, one trait, although things are much more complicated than than. Mendel thought they were, and then then we used to think they were. Uh, but if you're talking about, uh, or a couple of issues here include the question of what constitutes human normal human variation versus disability, and how do we make decisions about that? Right. Two canonical examples here are one um, achondroplasia. So people of short stature, um, many of these folks do not consider themselves disabled, right? They have um, a community, a culture. If they are um, lucky enough to be, you know, sufficiently financially secure that they can build their environments to fit their stature, then they function perfectly well. Right. It's not that they are disabled, but rather that the environment is disabling. Right. Another example is the big D deaf community. So people who identify with that with deafness as a culture. Again, here, these folks have their own language. They have their own schools in Gallaudet in in D.C. Um, they can again, they're structure their environments in ways that enable them to function just as well as any of us. So who decides whether or not they're disabled, right? And who's making the, the, the decisions about that? And what are the downstream implications of calling something a disease or a disability versus part of normal human variation? A second issue here is the impact of genetic testing on existing communities, right? So for example, if you, um, uh, uh, the example I'll use here is uh, trisomy 21, right? There are places in the world where there is excellent access to healthcare, to prenatal care and to prenatal genetic testing and, or, to, um, yes, genetic testing. And it is a norm that folks who um, find that they are carrying a fetus with trisomy 21 to abort that fetus. As a result, very, very few babies are born each year with trisomy 21. Contrast that to a place 
where that isn't the situation. There are many, many more people with trisomy 21. Those kids grow up in very different environments, right? With different um, role models and access to services and the motivation for research around those traits is very different, right? So how do we think about um, once we've made a decision about disability or disease, about the impact of testing on existing communities. And again, who's making those decisions? Contra complex traits are different, right? Because here, a complex trait is a trait that involves both, the ge both genes, inputs from genes, and the environment, right? So it's not one-to-one, -one, which in theory, Mendelian gen conditions are. Um, and the any test you do for these traits would be probabilistic, meaning it gives you sort of an idea of what a, a probability of what might happen without being um, definitive in any way. And that shapes how the ethical issues play out. There are also differences between early and late onset conditions and genetic testing. Right. So is a person who has a pathogenic BRCA1 mutation, so a mutation that's likely to cause or has a high probability of leading to breast cancer in a person, like how do you think about that status of having that mutation but not having cancer? Um, what not only from the perspective of the individual and self-concept, but also from the perspective of others and stigma and um, access to uh, access restrictions or liberties placed on that person. There's also a question here of pre-symptomatic genetic testing of kids. So do we test kids for adult onset conditions, genetic testing um, for adult onset conditions. Historically, we haven't done this. Historically, we have said that we will only do genetic testing in kids if it's gonna change medical management during the pediatric period, right? Otherwise, wait until they're of age and let them make their own decision about whether or not to go through testing. But because it's now so, because the cost of um, genetic sequencing has gone down so dramatically, and again, I'll come back to this in a bit, uh, it's often just more cost-effective and faster to do whole exome or whole genome sequencing on a kid who has something going on that you're not quite sure what. So suddenly you have all of that information and then you have to decide what to do about it. You have a you know one year old whole genome sequence, potentially adult onset um, risk factors indicated in their genome. Where does that information go? Who has access to it? Um, and how do you manage it? And then oversight of genetic testing um, in the, not only in the research space, um, but also in the context of clinical care. Another issue that we have talked quite a lot about and that I think we continue to wrestle with is the question of genetic exceptionalism, right? Should we be thinking about this information as being different from any other kind of medical information or should we not, right? Are these results different? It's absolutely true that genetic tests, testing results um, have possible implications for genetic family members. It is intrinsic, it is predictive, and it's probabilistic, right? Which does shape, you know, is some of these are a bit different than other kinds of medical information. But how we decide, what we decide about whether this information is the same as or different impacts lots of other questions, right? Like, why shouldn't insurance companies be allowed to use genetic information? Why shouldn't employers 
be allowed to use genetic information. Um, and again, we have we have wrestled in Elsie um, with these questions over time. Um, and as the technology has evolved, sort of the, the nature of the questions we've been asking have evolved. We now know, for example, that there are lots of different kinds of genetic information, right? Pharmac pharmacogenetic results are different than a BRCA likely pathogenic mutation are different than a Huntington's disease repeat number of 50, which guarantees that you're gonna get the disease, right? So the, the questions have, have shifted as the science has evolved. And then the last issue I'll talk about here is genetic determinism. The idea that your genotype completely determines who and what you are. And this, again, this is critically, how we decide on this, what we decide on this is critically important and has downstream effects, right? For our notions of free will, like are we actually making free autonomous choices? And for our notions of responsibility, both moral responsibility and legal responsibility, right? It's long time ago, people started claiming that their genes made them do that, do it in the court of law, right? And how do we, how do we think about that, particularly as our um, understanding of genetics evolves? And given the history of genetics and genomics in the eugenics movement, like being, how do we sort of walk that line? All right, now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about governance in this space. So governance is an umbrella term that we use to describe all the ways that we shape, guide, restrict activities or an area, right? For example, through law, through administrative guidance, through professional society standards or norms, et cetera. And I'm gonna, because again, this is just an introduction, I'm gonna offer just three different examples of important governance efforts in within genetics and genomics. So the first I'm gonna talk about is how we, how we think about human subjects protections in the context of genetics and genomics. So our protections start sort of the first, um, uh, document, sort of founding document for this area is the Nuremberg Code. So this came out of the um, Nazi doctor trials at the end of World War II uh, and identified the, um, the, what should the norms, what should govern human subjects, like how human subjects research should be shaped. This was codified in the Declaration of Helsinki. Here in the US, our sort of founding document is the Belmont Report. Uh, this came out of uh, the National Commission that followed the revelations about the Tuskegee syphilis trial. Um, and identified three ethical principles that should guide human subjects research. These are respect for persons, which includes both recognition of autonomy and protection for those who lack autonomy, beneficence and justice. And these have been sort of translated into um, our primary human subjects protections um, policy, which is the common rule. So the common rule governs federally funded human subjects research. Um, and in the context of the common rule, autonomy is acknowledged through the informed consent process. Right, so autonomy, people are ends in and of themselves. They're not means to others, other people's ends. Again, you get to decide what happens to you. And honoring that um, in the context of, of human subjects research, 
is through informed consent, which involves disclosure of what's going to happen, facilitating understanding. So you can't just do a data dump. You actually have to ensure that that the potential research participant understands uh, what they're making a decision about, and then promoting voluntariness. It's important to note for the purposes of genetics and genomics research that the common rule, um, the scope of the common rule is only human subjects research conducted or funded by the 17 or 18, depending on how you count, federal agencies and offices that are signed on to the regulation. Any research using either directly or indirectly identifiable information is subject to review by an institutional review board. And human and research involving anonymized data or samples is not subject to the common rule. And under the common rule, human subject research involves an in intervention or interaction with a living individual that would not occur but for the research, or the use of identifiable private data or information in a form associable with a living individual. And importantly, DNA does not count as identifiable. So because DNA does not count as identifiable, um, and because of um, what's written here, that under the common rule, it's not human subject research if the material in its entirely was collected for purposes other than for research, and the material is de-identified. So if you go to, if the material came out of the person in the context of normal clinical care, like that tissue was coming out, a blood sample, whatever, um, it had nothing to do with a researcher, it was all about clinical care, and the material is de-identified, it doesn't count as human subjects research. So you can go to the pathology lab, get a de-identified tissue sample, do research on that sample, and you don't need consent. Now, the reason we did this is because we thought, you know, that protecting human subjects was about ensuring that the risk benefit analysis was balanced, right? And that if there were risks being taken on, that people got to make decision, their own decision about whether or not to take on those risks. For genetic research, particularly if it if you're doing work on clinical samples, right? There's no physical risk associated with that because the tissue was coming out anyway for clinical care, and we thought that by de-identifying the sample, we could eliminate all the informational risks that might come with that research. So if we have eliminated the risks, the reasoning goes, then it we don't have to ask for consent. It's important to note though, that all of that was conceived of and decided upon before you even got to a genome that cost a hundred million dollars, right? At a time when genome sequencing was expensive and rare, and there just weren't a lot of data around. But again, the science has evolved, right? The lower cost, now that we're down at a, and have been for a while at a thousand dollar ish genome, means that we can use it in lots of different ways, right? It means we can do research studies that we could never do before because we can actually afford to sequence a bunch of people. It means that it can be used in clinical care much more readily. Um, but it also means that it can be used outside of the lab, right? And Alondra Nelson has this a book and a phrase, the social life of DNA, right? How, what happens um, with DNA once it's outside the lab and outside the clinic? And I also wanna note that there was an attempt, I'm not gonna go into it, but there was an attempt to address this increasing identifiability of DNA, which I talked about before, and its implications for research five to 10 years ago, at the time that we were revising the common rule. There was a proposal to sort of get rid of that not human subjects research designation for 
genetic and genomic and other kinds of um, genetic testing data. Um, but for a variety of reasons, changes were not made in this area. Although there were a bunch of other revisions to the common rule, the revisions, the proposal in this space did not go through. All right. The next example um, of governance in this space is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Right. This was um, took 13 years <laughs> to get through Congress, uh, but it was ultimately signed into law uh, in 2008 and has been in effect since 2009. And it prohibits the use of genetic information in two contexts, health insurance and employment. It prohibits the use of, of this information in decision-making in those two spheres. Under GINA, the definition of genetic information includes um, family medical history, carrier testing, prenatal genetic testing, susceptibility testing, and other kind, certain other kinds of analyses, genetic analyses. analyses. GINA does not apply to life insurance, disability, long-term care, and certain federal employees, although those folks um, are largely covered by other comparable policies. And this is why if you do go to a genetic counselor or contemplating genetic testing, you will often be advised to sort of insurance up, right? To get all of your insurances in order, um, because once you've tested, these other um, kinds of insurance can ask for that information. All right. And the last example um, of governance in this space, and then we'll go to the Q&A, is, uh, so the, the first one was about um, the common role, genetic, uh, genetic research um, and human subjects research generally. The second one was a uh, federal law, GINA. This one is a professional society policy statement that has been key um, to our conversation around the return of genetic results. So this paper um, here that came out of the um, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics was the their first effort to say, okay, we are now doing a lot of um, whole exome and whole genome sequencing for a variety of reasons. As I mentioned earlier with the pediatric testing case, once we have all this information, we have all this information. <laughs> so even if you went in looking for one thing, like you did a whole exome because you had a particular question in mind, you now have all the information. And we now know quite a lot about the human genome. We still don't know more, <laughs> but we know quite a lot about the human genome. And how do we think about and what do we do with regard to returning information to folks that we can actually um, tell them something about? So this paper came out in 2013 and covered, again, clinical genome and exome sequencing. I will say they went to great pains to say, A, this isn't standard of care. B, we're talking about clinical care, not research. But the research community was waiting um, with bated breath for this document as well. And many research studies have um, do return uh incidental or secondary findings now. So what this, what the ACMG did was to issue a minimum list of incidental findings. Again, these things that we didn't go in the, into the genome to look for, but we have them now. Um, we initially called them incidental findings. We now call them secondary findings because it's not like, oops, we found this other thing. We're specifically specifically going to look for it now. So it's now called a secondary finding. So this paper issued the, a minimum list of incidental findings to report to patients. 
including known and expected pathogenic changes in 56 genes. And this included adult onset conditions, including for kids, and quote, without reference to patient preference. So this goes to two things I told you about before, right? That historically we haven't tested kids unless we're gonna change medical management in the pediatric period and that people have a right not to know. So there were feelings about this, <laughs> they were expressed. Um, there was debate and discussion and a clarification was issued um, in which they said, okay, what we meant was you have to report to the physician but you don't have to report to the patient. The physicians were like, I'm not gonna have information and then not share it. So there was a bit more debate and discussion. Um, and then they sort of doubled down on everything else. And then there was another revision the next year saying that actually patients can opt out to the return of secondary findings prior to testing. And since then, there have been a series of revisions to the gene list um, as science has moved on and we've learned more. But this has been critical to our conversations about the return of results. And this is something I'll come back to in the next part of my talk as well about returning benefit to patients, which has become a a significant part of the conversation. And I will end there and take questions on what we've talked about so far. And I'll just remind you, you can put things in the chat, but it's also very fine to turn on your camera and ask Deborah your question directly. It's a safe space to do that. And, and you've heard the phrase, there are no dumb questions. So go ahead. I had a question. Yes, hello. Hi, hi, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, on your last point with sharing the information back to either the public or the patient or the community that the research was done to, how feasible do you think that is when you think about international countries like um, Africa or even other countries here in the US when you do studies in Puerto Rico or Colombia, for example, some of the resources doesn't get back to the communities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I I will talk about that more in the next part of my talk, um, but I will also answer part of it here. Right. So it is that it does raise a lot of issues about where that information is going back and what can be done with it, not just scientifically, but practically. Right. What if you're returning this information that uh, means that you need a bunch of additional medical surveillance and you don't have access to healthcare? Like that is going to potentially cause more problems than it's solving. And we have to grapple with that, right? We have to, and, or um, you raise the question of Africa, right? What if you are operating in a country in Africa that has low, doesn't have the medical expertise necessary to interpret and respond to the secondary findings that you're returning? Like what, what is the risk benefit uh, landscape in a case like that? And how do we work through that? in terms of ensuring that, again, we aren't creating more problems than we're solving. But I will, as I said, I'll talk more in the next section about um, increasing calls for return of value, not just from individuals, but also from communities. Um, and that's something that, that I think the field is grappling with and will be grappling with for, for quite some time. Thanks again for your question. Hi, um, I have a question regarding Gina and what it doesn't cover. I know you said like the veterans in the military, they have their own comparable um, program, but how 
like how well would you say that is like compared to what Gina offers? Like, is it as good or? Oh, uh, well, uh, I, first of all, I don't know the details well enough to answer the question. I'm also not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm a human geneticist. But um, the other thing I want to say about that, that I failed to say during my talk is that for insurance purposes, right, the protections of GINA were largely superseded by the Affordable Care Act, which prohibits um, discrimination based on pre-existing conditions. Um, so as long as the ACA stays around, then that covers um, the, the insurance side of GINA. Um, but of course, there's also the employment side. And honestly, we haven't seen a ton of cases um, being brought uh, under the employment protections offered by GINA. Any other questions? There's none in the chat. So, oh. also, no, there is not. There is not. Oh, okay. So I'm keeping an eye on that for you. Thank you. So, um, I don't see another live question. So, onward. Okay. All right. So, I was also asked uh, to talk about sort of what's what's coming next or what are the the newer issues that we've been grappling with? And many of the new and emerging issues that I'll talk about are only in front of us because of the relatively inex because of relatively inexpensive sequencing and how that changes what we can do with it and how much data are available and how it shapes that social life of DNA outside of the lab and the clinic. So I'm guessing that at least some of you might know who this is. This is from a few years ago now, um, from 2018. Um, but this um, is uh, Joseph D'Angelo, also known as the Golden State Killer. This was uh, the first time that investigative genetic genealogy was used to solve a cold case, meaning to identify, you know, solve a crime from many, many years before. Now, the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, was, I mean, it, it was a horrific case, right? He um, murdered uh, at least 13 people. Uh, he's accused of more than 50 rapes and dozens and dozens of burglaries in the 70s and 80s in California. Now, how they found him was they, you know, by this time, by 2018, um, we again, Ancestry.com, 23andMe, other direct consumer genetic testing companies, and not just those companies, but people had gone through testing, gotten their results, and then uploaded their results to third-party sites where they could do their own genealogy research, right? And find extend extended family members, um, find half siblings, et cetera. And one of these um, third-party sites called GEDmatch, um, the law enforcement uploaded a sequence from a crime scene sample and then identified hits in this database of potential relatives of this person and then built family trees to identify who would be around the right age, in the right place, at the right time, who might be a suspect. They identified one person, they got a sample out of his trash, uh, and they confirmed the match. And uh, Joseph D'Angelo was arrested in April of 2018. 
Since this case was revealed, over a hundred, well, now many um, hundreds of cases have been pursued this way. Um, and the third party websites, right, were, are now, you know, GEDmatch in particular, um, changed its terms and conditions a few times. Um, and I think there was a bit of revising of policies around law enforcement access to these publicly available databases. That said, uh, there are only two laws in the country that actually govern in this space. One of them is um, where I'm sitting here in Maryland. Um, and I I was very, I was had a very small part in this, um, but Natalie Ram um, on whose slides, the next few slides are based and is a colleague of mine at the University of Maryland in the law school um, was very much involved in this. Um, it took a number of years in Maryland to get it passed. Uh, but we do have a policy governing investigative genetic genealogy. It has a bunch of requirements um, governing this use of DNA, including judicial, judicial supervision, um, acknowledgement and consent from site users on the third party sites, wherever the, the whatever database is being used by law enforcement protections for non-suspect third parties, like those distant relatives of Joseph D'Angelo, defense and post-conviction access, consequences for violating this policy, and annual public reporting and review. There was a multi-stakeholder bipartisan working group that helped develop this law, um, including folks from the police, from the Public Defender's Office, the Innocence Project, um, and academics like Natalie and myself and others. Uh, the group met with genetic genealogists and private investigative genetic genealogy service providers. Uh, and ultimately the bill was enacted with almost unanimously and certainly bipartis with bipartisan support. The second policy is in Montana. And this is the whole thing. It's much simpler than the law in Maryland. It requires a warrant unless a consumer, quote, whose information and um, whose information sought, quote, waived their right to privacy. The tricky bit is that waive is not defined. So it's if it's defined rather loosely, then this actually provides very little protection. If even, you know, uploading to a site to do, you know, personal genealogical research constitutes waiving your right, then it, it doesn't um, provide much protection. The second sort of active area of inquiry in this space that uh, has uh, taken up a, a lot of um, oxygen and debate time, and I think will continue um, going forward, is genome editing. So lots of folks first heard about human germline genetic modification when these papers came out in 2015. Um, I imagine that a bunch of folks were like, what, why is everyone yelling about this? These are three things that came out in, very, in rapid succession saying, don't modify the germline. But then this came out, which was a paper um, that demonstrated germline genome editing. The reason that those three papers came out first is because these papers were circulating um, over the, the preceding winter. So they were being submitted and rejected from a whole bunch of journals. 
It was ultimately uh, received at the final journal on March 30th of 2015 and accepted on April 1st. I just like to note for the future scientists in the room that that's not usually <laughs> how fast the turnaround time is. Um, but these papers demonstrated again that we could do this. So if folks didn't hear about germline genome editing when those first three papers came out and didn't hear about it when these papers came out, they almost certainly heard about it when this gentleman, Hu Jung Kui, announced the birth of twin girls who he called Lulu and Nana in 2018. But we've actually been having this conversation for a very long time. So this is the first uh, big government report on germline um, genetic engineering in humans that came out of the President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and Be Biomedical and Behavioral Research in November of 1982. It was begun under Jimmy Carter, delivered to Ronald Reagan, who you know, many of you in the room might not even know who those people are. <laughs> this paper, Gene Technique Could Shape Future Generations, from Gina Collada. Uh, ethicists wary over new gene techniques consequences, 1984, or 1994, sorry. So 1982, 1994. We've been talking about these issues for a very long time. In this last round, those prior rounds of debates, the major concerns were concerns about safety, first and foremost. We just didn't have a technology that would allow us to do this in a way that was safe and effective. Concerns about consent. How do you think about and execute consent when the product of the research is a human? Right, it's a different sort of thing than we've done historically, um, and a challenge to be sure. Concerns about a right to an open future. Right, parents make decisions about their kids' lives all the time, but this is making a very particular decision about a, the genetic constitution of that child, based on the genetic knowledge we have at the time. So if you're making, you're, you are through those choices or constraining the possibilities for that pers potential person in a particular way. When talking about germline genetic modification, there are always the phrase designer babies is used, right? Concerns about commodification of kids, that they're gonna be products, not people in their own rights. Concerns about distributive justice, right? Who's going to have access to this technology? Um, concerns about treatment, well, and how are the risks and benefits of this technology's deployment going to be distributed? Concerns about treatment versus enhancement. This is another big issue historically in the in LC, right? How do you decide what constitutes a treatment versus an enhancement and why does it matter morally? And the conclusion in this prior round was don't do it today. But that conclusion, conclusion was largely hung on the safety concern, right? Because we just didn't have a technology that could do this. And yet, <laughs> though we've had this debate before, a lot has changed and context matters. And the current context is that we do now have a technology, right? We have CRISPR, which is relatively easy in the right hands and relatively inexpensive. Also, science is much bigger than it was in those prior rounds where the US and the West generally were sort of the the dominant moral norm in science. And not everyone feels the same way about human embryos and about the um, 
the moral value of our shared genetic um, sort of the, uh, sequence. The rest of science and medicine has also advanced. Right, there's a ton more that we can do in stem cell science that's related to this uh, AI that can help us understand things, et cetera. And there are real advocates, right? Every when I was giving talks about CRISPR quite a lot in any public forum, someone would come up to me afterwards and say, "We need these treatments now. We need to be able to do this science now because Huntington's disease or." cancer has devastated my family, right? And the the um, the landscape has just changed. We, in response to these advances, there have been many, many governance conversations, some of which I've been involved with as well. And on the germline genome editing, the conclusion is still, we're not there yet. This technology is not ready for prime time, but here is what, but frameworks have been developed for how to move forward in this space. In the meantime, we also have turned our attention to the use of this technology for somatic editing, right? For example, for treatment of sickle cell, um, and trying to grapple with the ethical issues that are here with us now with the use of this technology. And then this last issue, and I'm sorry about this, but I'm going to, I've realized that my animations aren't gonna work if I share that way. So I'm going to switch quickly. to this other mode of sharing. So the, the last issue I'm gonna talk about um, is data sharing and use. And again, this is something that we have been talking about for a very long time, but the scientific and social sands have sort of shifted underneath the issue and are shaping how we think about it. And this is where I come back to um, one of the questions that was asked during the Q&A. So currently we have, and we have for, since we got started doing large scale sequencing in the Human Genome Project in the mid nineties, for very good reasons, had a norm in genomics of broad, rapid sharing, right? This is particularly under the Human Genome Project, hugely expensive, lots of reasons to, and international, critically important that we were sharing data broadly and rapidly to ensure that we weren't duplicating effort, that we were learning from each other's experience, Etc., and it continues to be critically important because I can't give your particular genome any meaning unless I have lots of data from lots of people, both genetic data and clinical data, so that I can draw associations and actually figure out what that meaning is, right? So, critically important. We have human subjects rules that are really built for interventional research in a context of rare, expensive sequencing. So we still have that not human subjects research designation for a bunch of this work. As I was just talking about with investigative genetic genealogy, there are porous barriers now between some repositories, not all. <laughs> um, and in the US and the West in particular, there is a strong focus on autonomy and individuals, again, rightly so, but less of a focus on population and community level impacts. And these days it's more than just genomics, right? It's all the omics, 
and its environmental data, social determinant of health data, et cetera. Not only because we can handle a lot more data now, we have the tools necessary to analyze a lot more data now, um, but also because AI has come onto the scene. We've also shifted in science from, from what used to be the norm, which was specific consent, consent specific to the study at hand, to broad consent, meaning we would like to use your tissue, your data for a broad array of research questions, or we're gonna use it for this study here, but we would also like to use it later for lots of other kinds of research. We've been moving from local closed databases to more open international databases. There are increasing mandates to share, including from NIH, right? Again, for good, important reasons. There's increasing recognition that more diverse cohorts are needed, both from an ethical perspective and from a scientific perspective. And I'll come back to that in a second too. Increasing desire for AI-ready data sets, right? AI is super hungry. <laughs> um, and we, in order to take advantage of those tools, we need a lot of data um, and data that, that AI can usefully use. I've already described to you why the risks of to data might be increasing, right? With increased identifiability. And as I already alluded to in the Q&A, a desire for offsetting benefits, right? Folks understand that scientists are benefiting from this research. This certainly came out with the Henrietta Lacks story, right? Scientists have gotten a lot out of that cell line. Pharmaceutical companies have, and other companies have made a lot of money off that cell line. And their folks generally have been asking questions like, what, what are we, what are the benefits that we are getting back from all of this? There's also been a shift over the last 15 years or so from talking about research subjects to talking about research participants, right? We're not subjecting folks to research, but people are participating in research. And there's continues to be a push toward away from research participant and even towards research partner. There are regular calls for public engagement, right? I have said frequently that it used to be the last recommendation in any um, consensus document was more research is needed, and it's now public engagement is needed. Um, we have sort of accepted that this is something that we should be doing, involving publics in our research, in research decision-making, although we haven't figured out um, necessarily how to do that really effectively in all cases. There's an increasing focus on equity and justice for a whole variety of reasons and on the population level of impact of research, not just the individual level um, impacts. And there is, I think, a really important um, movement happening with the indigenous data sovereignty movement. So indigenous colleagues who are working in science, in genetics, who are scientists doing this work, but who think about it in a little bit different way, right? And one great example of this is the, the contrasts between the fair and care principles of data stewardship. So the gold standard scientific um, principles for data sharing are the FAIR principles. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, right? To get the biggest bang for your buck um, for the data that you have, 
right? Recruiting people is expensive. Um, it takes a lot of time. We want to maximize the scientific benefit. So the FAIR principles um, are sort of the gold standard there. The indigenous scientific community has offered a different vision for this, which are the CARE principles, which stand for collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. And I think you can probably see how these two sets of principles might lead to very different models um, and governance around data sharing. And an important piece of this, the increasing focus on equity and justice, um, the indigenous data sovereignty movement, movement, a point from a prior slide about increasing acknowledgement that for both scientific and ethical reasons that we need uh, diversity in research at multiple levels is demonstrated here by sort of what we all know is a persistent bias in genetics and genomics with regard to who it is we're studying. All right, so this um, paper from 2009, um, from, uh, or this, sorry, <laughs> the data for from 2009, this paper from Popejoy and Fullerton from 2016 showed that you know, the vast majority of genetic data that we have available to study are from people of European descent. And in a follow-up study um, by Sarah Tishkoff and colleagues, found that we hadn't actually moved the ne needle very far, right? It is still the case that the majority of genetic data we have available, genome-wide association studies, tissue samples that we have available to study are from people of European descent. And we are the least genetically diverse people on the planet. And we can't understand or develop treatments toward genetic diversity that we've never seen, right? So this is a critically important piece of the puzzle that we continue to grapple with and we're going to continue to grapple with going forward. So the other side of that coin or part of that conversation though um, is how we actually use the racial, ethnic, or population identifiers in the context of genetic research. Now, this is a report that came out of the National Academies about a year ago um, that talks specifically about that issue um, and calls on geneticists, calls on scientists to think really critically and rigorously about how they're using race, ethnicity, and other population descriptors in genetic and genomic research. I think scientists have been a bit um, unthinking about how they're using race and ethnicity, et cetera, in their research. We really need to be collecting additional data, so social determinants of health, environmental, et cetera, other data, so that we could actually distinguish what is an impact of the DNA that we have in front of us versus what's an impact of the environment or other um, factors about a person's life. So again, a call to be really rigorous about how you think about your use of race and ethnicity um, in designing your and research and analyzing your results, um, a call to broaden the data that are collected to better answer the questions that we have about the genetics. And then finally, a request to please stop using the word Caucasian because it was a eugenics word, eugenicists word, um, and we should move on from that.
So is the same at the same time that that science was evolving um, and norms were shifting there, of course, society has moved and shifted and evolved as well. There's more recognition that income and health equality inequality can't be ignored. There's a lack of social cohesion and solidarity. The experience that we've been through with COVID-19 and what it taught us about how our society is structured and who has access and who doesn't, et cetera, and the sort of parallel um, or simultaneous Black Lives Matter movement that raised a bunch of issues in this country um, to the surface that had been there for a long time. And it's important to note um, in thinking about the risk benefit analysis in this new landscape for genetic research that many publics have no reasonable expectation of benefit. Right here in the US, we don't have a guaranteed right to healthcare. We don't have a national healthcare system. So we can't promise that any benefit, clinical benefit that comes out of this research that everyone who participates in the research will actually have access to that benefit. And that is something that, that we need to think about, um, given that the risks have evolved, we need to think about how the benefits should evolve as well. So there's a bunch of, because of time, again, there's a a uh, bunch of sort of supporting documents that that I can share later, but that I didn't have an opportunity to go through um, that I'm summarizing here along with what I did talk about. So patients and research participants do support research generally and are very happy to, happy to contribute data and tissues um, and want to be altruistic but they also, also want to be asked. It's a marker of respect. Patients and research participants are less willing to support and contribute their data if there's a commercial company involved. Although I do wanna emphasize that this is not a universal view, right? People who are very sick, people who have kids who are very sick could care less about privacy concerns and would really just like the research to move forward as quickly as possible to benefit their kids and or to benefit themselves or their kids or people um, like them who have a particular condition. The primary driver of informed consent based on research is trust, right? People consent to research if the person, if they trust the person and the institution asking them. For historical and contemporary reasons, minoritized and minor, my, marginalized populations are less willing to contribute and have less access to benefit. And as I've already noted a couple of times, there are increasing calls from both individuals and communities for return of value or benefit. So what's a scientist to do, right? First and foremost, demonstrate trustworthiness, right? You can do that through transparency about what it is you're doing, both now and in the future, through informed consent, through shifting some of the control over research or decisions to the publics that they affect, Figuring out the return of value challenge, and there's a increasing work happening in this space, and through public engagement, and you know, I these are just some ideas, and I also want to note there are many scientists who operate this way already, right? Who do public engagement, who think about return of value, um, who have robust well. Everyone should have robust informed consent, um, et cetera. But it's not necessarily, all of these things are not necessarily the norm. And I'm also not, I mean, no one in the LC world expects scientists to be able to do it all, 
right? So collaborating with social scientists, folks in the LC space, et cetera, to try to respond to, again, the shifting risks and the increasing calls for return of value. So my final slide, you know, science has evolved dramatically and our ethics and governance frameworks need to as well. Science doesn't exist in a vacuum. Again, Alondra Nelson's notion of the social life of DNA. And we need to start thinking at the, not only the individual level, but also the community or population level about the distribution of risks and benefits, not just among racial, ethnic, or geographic, or um, socioeconomic groups, but also between researchers and those whose samples and data make scientists' work possible. And with that, I'm happy to take questions again. I'd encourage you to fire up your camera and ask questions. Um... Why I'm waiting, there's a one question in the Q&A chat from, from Binta. Um, I'm going to try to paraphrase quickly is, um, how can we establish a system where data sharing to and from local and international databases means equity for the people or place where the data is being collected or acquired and from utilized? So is data colonialism the new norm or is the more care principle something that we can in can integrate. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the question. So this is a place where we have models, right? But just not in the human space. So the Convention on Biological Diversity, part of that is the Nagoya Protocol, which articulates um, approaches to access and benefits sharing for, um, I mean, it's originally about biological diversity, right? So you go into a place that's a, a biodiversity hotspot that is uh, in the global South and you derive benefit from the biodiversity. You're from the global North, you derive benefit from um, the biodiversity you find there. And it's a system for thinking about how do you then return benefit to the place from which the samples or data came I think there is a model there that we can learn from in the human subject space, but that we just haven't um, done a lot of connecting the dots. And there are some countries that prohibit data being exported. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So there are there are countries that prohibit any data um, from their citizens to leave the country. Including the world's largest country population wise. Okay, any other questions? We will be um, finishing up the recording and, and Deborah will stay on for any people who were too shy to ask on the record or who just want to ask more general questions or personal questions, not too personal. <laughs> I don't see any hands. I don't see any other chats. Deborah, <laughs> I've got a question. Is yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering how we grapple with the consequences of bad actors. For instance, with Lulu and Nana, you know, the scientist was public or punished for that. Yeah. Um, but how do we grapple with um, the ramifications of those? Like we're still using HeLa cells, even though they were obtained without consent. Um, Lulu and Nana's outcomes will be scientifically important one way or another. Um, so how do we deal with Well, if we ever learn anything if about them. If we learn who they are, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, and how do we, as a community, grapple with these bad actors and the outcomes that they create? Yeah. No, I mean, that that because science is done by humans, this will always be a problem, right? And it was, it's been a problem in genetics right from the beginning, right? The the RAC, the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, that entire thing was set off by, you know, some people had said, actually, let's 
let's pause and not do this. And then some other folks said, Ooh, this is like super juicy. Let's do this. Hey guys, guess what we did. <laughs> and it led to the whole field sort of coming together and deciding what they were going to do about uh, to regulate or govern um, recombinant DNA technology. And honestly, a similar thing happened after Ho Jung Kui made his announcement uh, because Ho said, well, I read all of your guidance documents and I think I was following them. And the people who developed those documents were like, oh, <laughs> we need to get really specific then, don't we? And so they came back together and got much more specific about what was in bounds and what was out of bounds. I think that's part of the answer, um, but it, it will never be all of the answer. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's not a problem that's going to go away because humans. The, there was one thing that I did want to pick up on um, that you said about HeLa cells, right? The, there was clinical consent. There wasn't research consent, it, right? If her name had never been disclosed, and perhaps if it was not called HeLa, right? That's still work that could be done today within federal guidelines. If it came out in the context of clinical care and it was de-identified, you can make a cell line with that today. And it is compliant with federal policy. Okay, well, I wanna thank Deborah for, we're gonna close the, um, for the presentation, we're gonna close the more formal section and um, we'll stop the recording now and feel free to hang on and ask questions as we go. <laughs>